Welcome everyone to a very special casted game. It's going to be a best of five series with SAS sporting on the west side of the map, playing in blue as the Byzantines. And his opponent in the southeast, playing in red, we've got Give You Anxiety, playing as the Delhi Sultan. Mm. Welcome everyone to Dry Arabia. That's going to be map number one. So as we said, it's a best of five. So hopefully you're going to be seeing lots of games. Two very talented players in Age of Empires 4 and two great civilizations. Delhi Sultanate is an exciting one. It's one of those civilizations that get technologies for free. And they can really pack a punch in the feudal age. They've got a lot of aggression built into them, possibly. We shall see. They do tend to play with that one base opening, one town center, and then sticking with that, really. Looking to challenge to get the sacred sites in the mid-map. Whereas we have the Byzantines, a little bit more of a different civilization, kind of flexible in ways in terms of what they open with. Can opt for Grand Winery, possibly an Imperial Hippodrome. Now with a matchup like this, the Byzantines tend to have a power spike in the Castle Age, whereas the Delhi, they seem to get going in the Feudal Age. So it's going to be exciting one to see how much pressure Give You Anxiety puts on with the Delhi Sultanate. And how much the Byzantines can soak up. Now SES might be opting for the Imperial Hippodrome. Could be a nice choice between the two because whilst you do have the Grand Winery which gives you an additional 60% olive oil from the berry bushes and olive groves, it takes some time for that landmark to really pay back. Whereas the Imperial Hippodrome of course gives you the access to stable units right off the bat and it's something that he might need to rely on considering the aggression that can come out from the Delhi Sultanate. Either way, it's going to be interesting to see how SAS plays this, this out and um, well, we'll see how Jiwe, whether he sticks to the Delhi meta which is generally pumping out units in the Feudal Age. And after this, of course, we'll have at least three matches, of course. Best of five means essentially whoever gets to winning three games will win the series, win the set. Now, this uh, tournament, or this show match, rather, is hosted by Andy. So big shout out to him for putting up the prize pool. Uh, without that, of course, this, these games wouldn't happen. So big shout out to him. In fact, leave a comment section. Leave a little heart emoji for Andy. Just to show appreciation for him, because obviously... Without that prize pool, these games wouldn't happen. It's going to be the Tower of Victory landmark chosen here for GUA. No real surprises them. They do pack a punch with this landmark. Can sometimes see uh, the Dome of the Faith. But um, it's been kind of going out of fashion recently. Tower of Victory does offer a lot of aggression in the Feud Legion. Additional 20% attack speed for the infantry units. It's a really nice landmark to get for the Delhi. Now, Byzantines are actually opting for the Grand Winery. So it's going to need to stick it out in the... Feudal Age and get some production buildings to defend instead of relying on the Imperial Hippodrome. But bear in mind that the Byzantines with this Grand Winery landmark, they can really come online in that early Castle Age. They have to get there. But once they do, the number of mercenaries they can get can be quite spectacular. It could be interesting to see which actual uh, contract he goes for. Either way, hope you guys have enjoyed the content on the channel so far recently. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, that's a bit janky, isn't it? Well, we'll maybe I need to fix that ticker timer for a little bit later. But yeah, big thank you for everyone who's supporting, whether it be on YouTube or Twitch. Tower Victory almost built. So is the Grand Winery. Going to be opening up with the barracks for the Limitane. So going to be getting us a bit of protection because we do often see the Ghazi Raiders popping out for the Delhi Sultanate. Now bear in mind, whilst the Byzantines might be looking to posture towards that castle age, the Delhi Sultanate, they do have this little added dimension of, well, whilst they're kind of extending the Feudal Age often, they can cope with uh, going up against a Castle Age army because of the fact that the Ghazi Raiders do get that bonus damage against heavily armoured units. It allows them to do a little bit better than most other civilizations in the Feudal Age, or some other civilizations at least. Plenty of sheep being brought up here for the Byzantines, and I wonder how quickly Sassi will look to get a second system in fact there it is just going to connect them up with the aqueduct and look to increase that water level and increase the gather speed of those villages there's that stable opening as it expects no blacksmith opening just yet but plenty of villages on wood so possibly looking to get that relatively soon that's quite nice for the delhi sultanate is they can rely on food on the berries to tie them over to supply the army it allows them to get units out nice and early and then once they do get a couple of units out, they can possibly look out to go to deer camps and other berry bushes. In fact, this could be a nice area to try and secure here for GUA. Plenty of food on offer with the deer camp and the berries. Speaking of deer camp and berries, similar sort of symmetrical map layout here on the west side. Sassy could look to try and protect that area. If he gets some palisade walls on the front here and then to the wood line, 
to the edge of the map is a bit of an investment, but it could be worthwhile one if it secures that food, which you might need, because once you do run out of the berries from the Byzantines and the sheep, they'll need those olive grove transition. And it can be an expensive one. Here comes the first of likely many Ghazi raiders out for Jiro. And of course, queuing up those free upgrades as you do. Looking to get that mercenary house after getting the Limitane out. Got a couple on the berries, so certainly to protect that source of food. It's pretty exposed. But I like the fact that he's prioritizing the berries, not only because, of course, he gets the olive oil, but the food as well. And then they could go back to the to the sheep once it has taken all of those. Because, of course, you want to take your most risky resources first, ideally. Looks like GUA just poking and prodding his head through, but, of course, two Limitano chasing. GUA just dragging them away from the main base and then maybe looking to wrap around. There are a couple of Limitano just waiting for him on the berries. It's going to be... The Eastern Mercenary Contracts, so we'll have access to the Keshiks, the Gulam, and also the Tower Elephant. They could uh, prioritize the mobility more than anything else. It's going to get a stable as well. So Barracks and Stable opening here for Sassy. Back at home, the Delhi Sultanate. Now opting for the Barracks and Archer range. So one of each, the GUA special really, does have one Blacksmith working away at those upgrades. They're good to get Iron Undermesh first and then Steeled Arrow, so quite possibly... Expecting quite a few ranged units popping out, and Sassy does have the walls going up on the west side. We talked about this potential option, and in fact, he's going to get the second deer camp behind the walls as well. And I like that play. I mean, ultimately, you know, it's it's a good way to protect that food. And if you can get minimal palisade wall investment, that food is definitely going to be important to sustain an army production. GUA though, popping forward with uh, a couple of scholars outside and he's going to get them garrison inside the production buildings and supervise those efficient production will allow him to produce a little bit quicker here as the delhi sultan plenty of guards are popping forward but he's not attacking just yet it's kind of concerning for jiwei actually because he's kind of allowing sassy to breathe it's kind of not really what you want to do and allow the byzantines to get away with double archery range as well is really committing to that feudal age we talked about how the byzantines can sometimes posture towards that castle age but Sassy not risking anything, making sure he's got a good standing army before he even thinks about going to the castle age. And GUA looking to protect that right side as well. So looking to carve up the map, make sure he gets the free food on the map. And it makes sense in terms of the map layout for both players. Just secure in the corners, we'll access the berries and the deer camp. We do have Sassy in the chat. Welcome, my dude. Welcome, welcome. Ah, oh, just another reminder, by the way, both these players, of course, do stream on Twitch. So you're going to want to check their point of views out at some point because they do play a very high level Age of Empires 4. I'll, link, I'll leave a link in the video description where you can find them on Twitch. It's certainly something definitely advisable. We've cast a lot of their games and of course both players are you know, the top level of Age of Empires 4, hence the show match. So I'm sure you guys will want to check them out at some point. A couple of guys are ready to go around the south side, but the Palisade Walls are already up for Sassy. Gives them access to the deer camp. Bear in mind, you don't get olive oil for the deer, but hey-ho, we still get a lot of food that way. And he's just going to run into a couple of Keshiks. That's going to be a decision point here for Sassy. At what point does he think about going to the castle age? Bear in mind the Delhi at this point, sort of 10 minute mark, he might be starting to posture onto the map to get those sacred size. I'm kind of half surprised that he hasn't already done so. But it could be for the fact that he went for the Dome of the Faith, so it does... Sorry, the Tower of Victory, rather. So it does make him a little bit slower to get those Scholars out. That's one of the uh, little things you forego by going for the Tower of Victory over the Dome of the Faith. Looks like he is moving out now, slowly but surely. Getting an outpost on the Ford Gold, which I really like, actually, because this is probably the weakest point. Um, it's still open, obviously, in some ways, although it is walled up to the town centre. It's quite a direct area to pressurise for GUA. If he wants to cause some damage. Now the water level is now up to still water level two, but he's gonna extend that relatively soon onto the deer camp. And that's gonna be a nice bit of boosting of the villagers taking the food here. Backsmith is open and working. Of course the Byzantines are a little bit outnumbered at this point. It's expected. You expect the Delhi Sultan to really have a mass of units. He's also getting a house they might be wondering why is he doing that? Well the Byzantines have a nice upgrade in them. That do give them an extra bit of vision, border settlements, or he could just be getting a house because he's, you know, he, he needs it. <laughs> it could quite possibly be just getting it for that because he does have an outpost, giving the extra vision anyway. 
But plenty of Keshex, a couple of Libertar, and a couple of Archers. So both players are going for one of each. This could come to a, a good micro battle, i got to say. When you have kind of a multifaceted army like this, it really comes down to who can micromanage their army uh, the better of the two. Heading out into the Stealth Forest GUA, making sure he manages to get out of there. Does have the Sig Sight in the north, so we'll get that little bit of gold trickle in. Which would be powerful for the Deadly Sergeant to help them itch towards a potential castle age. Plenty of wood in the bank, though, for GUA. The question is, what is he expecting to spend that on? I don't think you expect to see a farming transition anytime soon. So maybe getting some more production buildings. Maybe he's going to stick out in the feudal age a little bit longer. But there's a lot of wood is floating. Kind of interested to see what he decides to do with that. Guys, he ready to just poke and prodding. Cassie, Sassy does look to try and decap that sacred site, but it won't happen. Not anytime soon, anyway. Water level 3 is up and running now, so that will give him a nice boost to his villagers. 18% gather speed. It's a nice bit of boost in there. Since the recent patch has been upgraded, it would have usually been given, I believe, 15%, but now, of course, the extra. A little bit extra. Gonna get a, an outpost on the front here as well, GUA. Just to protect the forward berries. Keshik just riding on through. He's running into the outpost. He's gonna know about it now. Did take a couple of those units from Sassy. Sassy's so going to decap the South Sacred Site. And just as well, because you can't really allow the Delhi Sultan to, to keep access to those Sacred Sites uncontested. So Sassy doing the right thing by moving out to the map. In fact, this is the South Sacred Site. No, I half didn't actually spot that. It's quite in the corner. It's a bit of an awkward map generation in that regard. Just going to be chasing with those Keshiks. Resource-wise, both players actually relatively similar resources in the bank. The question is whether GUA starts to save out that god for Castle Age. It almost seems like he is actually. Plenty of food in the bank. I think I think GUA is thinking about that Castle Age. Which is kind of interesting to think about. The, the concern for the Delhi Sultanate, by the way, going to the Castle Age, in terms of comparative to other civilizations, their power spike to the Castle Age isn't absolutely huge. I mean, especially if they've got a standing army. And the reason why I say this is because it takes some time for the standing army units to upgrade, whether it's archers or, you know, Ghazi raiders. You do need a lot of scholars, and obviously going Tower of Victory means you probably won't have all that many. So the research time is quite significant. Of course, the castle age timing, though, does allow them to get the armoured units in terms of whether it be lancers or man at arms, or in this case, uh, Gulam. Of course, he has to get to the castle age and then pump out those units. And bear in mind, with the good standing army here for Sassy, he'll need a decent number of those units to really mount a response. And you can see how much of a feudal age army is invested into, right? So the Delhi will certainly look to get those upgrades. I mean, they're free after all, so they'll definitely get the upgrades. But effectively, GOA probably won't want to fight until he gets the veteracy upgrade. He's going to go for the compound of the defender. So he'll be able to get access to the cheaper keeps. It's not like other civilizations that get to the castle age and then they start heading out into the map and be aggressive and pump out units. The standing army here will have to be upgraded for GUA and that'll take some time. And bearing that in mind, it allows Sassy to breathe. It allows him to see, okay, my opponent's going to the castle age. I've got a decent standing army, so maybe I'll stop producing and go to the castle age myself. And you get the feeling that's when the Byzantines really start to come online. You know, they had a bit of time with the Grand Winery, getting the valuable uh, olive oil. And he's got the Olive Grove transition starting up as well. But he is lacking on the uh, on the Castle Age resources that he needs. He's probably going to be looking to be a bit aggressive, actually, before the upgrades come in. So that's another thing to think about for GUA and the Delhi. Yep, sure, you can get the Castle Age timing in, but it takes so much time for the upgrades to come in that actually your opponent might just think about attacking. There's no way to speed up those upgrades either. So they just take up the time, or you can speed them up with more Scholars, but you know, that's not a quick fix. It's not a quick, easy thing to do. And big concern for GUA. He's got a lot of production buildings on the front line, which are about to go down. And he's looking to get those heavily armoured units. This is an issue, actually, because those are the key production buildings he needs. Stables for the Lancers, barracks for the Ghulam. This is one stable so far. And that just leaves him with two barracks and a stable behind that. So it's a bit of an uh, unfortunate situation that his key res uh, resource or production buildings rather on the front. It's a different story if he's taking out the archery range, because he's not really thinking about getting archers per se. Well, he does have the upgrade coming in that one, so if that goes down, that's absolutely huge. I'm not sure if Sassy has clocked onto that. He's pushing on forward anyway. Bear in mind, the Limitane can tank a lot of arrow fire with their shield wall ability. 
We've been on the right side with the cavalry, but we run into a couple of Gulan. Behind this, it will be the Golden Horn Tower. We're we'll itching towards that castle. It's actually a really good position for Sassy because he's got a lot of map control, got a lot of the units on the field. And it's still going to take a decent number of... I mean, take a look at how long that takes. Holy moly. Three minutes, 20 seconds. I mean, Sassy's going to get to the castle age before then. And it just shows you how difficult it is. That little bit of a blip to get to the castle age. How difficult it is to really make that count. Does have a Manganel though. So he is committing to the castle age specific units. And he's starting to... Uh, well, he lost the barracks. The stable rather on the front. Yeah, Getting the Gulam, but it's not all that fast. Especially when there's no Scholar's Garrison inside. Now Sassy has the presence of mind just to send an arch down the south sacred site. To decap it. Keeping his presence on the map and challenging that. And it's always a sort of site for the Delhi. When they don't have any of those sacred sites in their control. Oh, sneaking out. Killing one of those Keshiks. But Sassy won't necessarily mind that that much. I mean, he loses his unit. But he keeps his enemy back at home. And... That allows him now to safely get to that castle age with the Golden Horn Tower. A very nice landmark for the Byzantines. We'll be giving them access to uh, mercenary units for free occasionally. They'll pop out nicely. And you can see the difference in timing, right? Look at the upgrades coming in. The Limitani going to be taking 31 seconds. In fact, he might get the Limitani upgrade before the Spearmen do come in for the Delhi. That's exactly going to happen. And it shows you that delayed power spike for the Delhi. He does have two mangonels, which could turn that fight quite significantly, especially considering the heavily infantry-based army for the Byzantines. And will he drop down to Siege Workshop to get a spring old or two? Does he know about the mangonels? That's a key bit of information, actually. A key bit of detail that I'm sure he would love to know about, or would be important for him to know about. Heading towards the middle map. We'll be taking out a couple of those Keshiks, possibly. No, actually, they'll get out of there anyway. The guards are ready. Should be a bit faster, so I might be losing one. How's it going, Diplore? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. It's good to be back for sure. So I've been taking... I took a little bit of time off because I was a bit sick, actually, for most of it. And then I did a couple of days of Stormgate casting, which is good fun, but definitely good to be back. A bit rusty when it comes to Age of Empires forecasting, but we'll get there eventually. We'll get there. Have decent army numbers here for Sassy. Could possibly be moving out soon. Heading to the almost 19th minute of the game. It feels like this game might posture into just one big battle in the middle of the map. You get the feeling that it's kind of edging towards that direction, right? Both players kind of going towards the middle of the map. Jiwei not quite capturing the sacred sites once again. Yeah, he looks like he's moving out. Limitano leading that front line with a couple of archers and Keshiks at the back. Jiwei just keeping his cavalry on guard. Just to see where the Byzantines are. Oh, Keshik's moving forward. Sassy should see that happening now. Cavalry might engage before everyone else. We shall see. Behind this nice farming transition for the Delhi. I suspect there's a decent olive grove transition. Actually, it hasn't needed to rely on it just yet. So it might happen soon. Keshik's riding in. Looking to maybe get a wrap around on the Manganels. Doesn't quite manage it. Too many spearmen there. Does take out the, the scholar looking to get the... The relic, bearing that in mind, uh, there is one relic brought in for Sassy, three already for GOA. And Sassy actually looking to get the sacred site in the south. It's always a weird situation when you're going up against the Delhi and you're the one getting the sacred sites. Sassy just looking to maybe try and get a flank around. I like this play, keeping his active army moving across the map. The GOA not taking the bait, making sure his spearman is on guard. Ghazi is going to chase them down a little bit. But bear in mind, the Delhi do have a little bit of an advantage on this because of the movement speed of those Ghazi Raiders. So we'll be able to chase down the cavalry relatively well. Sassy just looking to bring a relic back home or two. Man of Times. It's not actually Gulab, actually. The Delhi have Man of Times. Okay. Yeah, that shows you how rusty I am casting Age of Empires 4 recently. I'm thinking about the Abbasid Dynasty and the Ubers, of course, when I refer to Gulam. 
Where both players pretty standoffish in game number one, respecting the situation. Springled on the field for the Delhi. Springled out here for the Byzantines as well. Now, again to the stage where Cataphracts are coming onto the map. They're pretty expensive units, but once they get going, they can be really, really strong if they're getting good numbers. Got a nice trample ability. Now, I love the fact that he's doing that because if he does get a good number of them, he might just trample on through the army and look to try and snipe out a Manganel too. Kashik's leading that line, but doesn't want to engage just yet. Just waiting for the limit on it to get in position. A couple of archers getting a couple of shots on the cavalry. Cavalry will tank around a bit. You can see what Sassy's intent is. Moving around on the right side to get, get a massive Manganel shot here, GOA. Has got two, only one spring off for Sassy, so we'll take some time. Manganels start to fire off. The cavalry trying to get around the backside to try and get on top of the siege. He might just, because there's mostly archers there. But he does take a couple of Manganel shots here, Sassy. But he's going to be clearing out most of this, I think. I think the numbers just looking better for Sassy. 102 military to 72. Despite the Manganel shots, two Manganels still survive. One remains. And that Springle needs to take out that Maganel quick time if he can. Maganel still firing on the crossbows in the back line. But most of the army is being cleared up for GOA. He's really struggling. The Limitane is soaking up much of the arrow fire. Looking to try and get behind that army on the retreat. Wait, he's going past. He's going to attack move. He's just going to try and cut off the cavalry, you feel. And he does just that. It's going to stop the cavalry from charging away. And the range units for GOA, he's going to struggle. He's going to lose almost everything, you feel. That's a good push out. A good fight here for Sassy. Behind all of this, though... Will Jiwe have enough army? Will he have enough coming out? Will he have enough static defenses? It doesn't seem like it. Doesn't have a keep. So this is going to be a situation he can't defend. He taps out. Game number one goes to Sassy. A great opening for him. A great start. We're going to head into game number two. GG's. That's a good start to the set for Sassy for sure. Let's get the, uh, the points all started off. Interesting opening. I think it was obviously a relatively passive game. Both players were kind of... Know, sensing each other out maybe and it was a good game though ggs let's go into game number two in this best of five all righty all right i hope you guys are having a good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you are in the world we're going to be going into game number two no real stoppages here it's going to be on cliffside and it's going to be juicy legacy versus the english with gua on the Juicy Legacy. Sassy on the English. Kind of an interesting matchup, I've got to say. Like, we don't see it all that often. It kind of feels that it's quite a strong matchup for Juicy Legacy, but we'll have to see what Sassy has in store for us. In fact, let's get the scores just switched around a little bit because it is indeed the other way around. There we go. Alrighty. Welcome everyone to game number two between Sassy and GUA. Sassy spawning in the southeast corner of the map, playing in blue as the English. And of course, as we know, his opponent, GUA in the northwest, playing in red as the Jushi Legacy. Welcome everyone to Cliffside. An interesting matchup. Both civilizations have the potential to be aggressive. Both civilizations have the potential to be pretty turtly and pretty camping out on their main base and I gotta say, in many ways, it feels like the Jushi Legacy can do what the English can do, but a lot better. I mean, when you factor in the Song Dynasty for the Jushi Legacy getting cheaper farms that way, they can spam them out. And, you know, the Song Dynasty comes online when they kind of need those farms. And it's a, I feel it's a very hard matchup for the English, but I'm excited to see what Sassy might have in store for us. Would he look to try and be aggressive or play a bit more passively, try a wall up? Cliffside is also an interesting matchup, uh, map for this matchup because of the fact that they can look to try and wall up these small ridges. So the issue is, is that. Yeah, you might be able to wall up the middle, but often players can sneak around the sides, and so unless you have all of it covered, you can be pretty exposed. Either way, English, of course, one of the civilizations, popular ones for Age of Empires 4, and Jushi Legacy, one of the new ones as part of the Sultan's Ascend DLC, so players still figuring the civilization out. Although, I've got to say, I think it's probably one of the civilizations from the new DLC that's figured out pretty quickly. Uh, you just beat them away with them, really play the macro game because it can be pretty strong now there is a kind of a 1tc jukanu push that they can go for whether it's something he's going to opt for for today gua i'm not so sure i wouldn't put it past him he's one of these players that actually if you guys are aware of gua and how he plays his play style it can be very aggressive at times so if there's a player that's going to be doing that kind of play you know he's going to be the kind of guy to do it and why not when you're up against the longbows if you can gap close and just minimize the range advantage that they have the jukanu they're just straight up better they do have to gap close and get within range. It's going to be the Council Hall. No real surprises there for Sassy. Going to be going up with three villagers to build that. 
But I think really, you know, we're kind of expecting a couple of longbows opening here for the English and then maybe look to get to the castle age eventually. The question is, is how aggressive does Sassy want to be and how aggressive Jiyue wants to be? Now, in many ways, you'd expect the Jushi legacy to be relatively passive, maybe Song Dynasty, maybe possibly two town centers. But I've got to say with Jiyue, you never really quite know. He's a kind of player that's hard to, uh, you know, he's not necessarily totally sticking to meta players these days. That's probably one of the reasons why it's so exciting to watch him play. All right, barracks opening as well. So it definitely looks like Sassy going to be aggressive. You tend not to drop that second production building unless you're going to be aggressive. And I think in many ways, the English kind of have to be aggressive in this situation because whilst Jiwe does have the option to be aggressive himself, the threat almost of Jiwe of and the Jewish legacy being passive and greedy is one that you cannot let go. It's something when you go up against the Jewish legacy, you have to try and find ways to limit their economy, whether it be putting pressure on the meditation gardens, whether it be, you know, trying to put pressure on a second town center that they may have put down anything you can do to try and stop them doing what they do best which is booming that economy it looks like sassy with the english are going to try and do just that one good thing for the english is they do have access to the man of times and the feudal age it's a unit that uh, again most civilizations can struggle against that whether the juicy legacy struggle against it or not i don't think so i mean when you can mass up a good number of chukunu their burst attack, it 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 can do it can do wonders against even man at arms. Unless you have a huge mass of man at arms that you can just flood your enemy with. But you know, you're gonna need at least 10, 12 minutes to establish that kind of numbers. And it is very tricky to do so. It's gonna be an archery range opening, so Chukanu on the menu for Jushi Legacy. It's the only range unit actually they get in the feudal age. And it's gonna get the double broadax upgrade as well, just to help them supply. The resources to do so now this meditation garden is in a really nice spot actually gets a little bit of everything and this will start to escalate of course the meditation garden has only just gone up so these numbers will rise but the access to stone does allow him to get maybe a second town center relatively slowly either way a couple of units popping out for sassy already spearmen and longbowmen the old spearmen longbowmen rush from the english coming out here that does have some potential to harass that wood line Woodline's a little bit exposed with two of them being on the front here for Jiwei, but could posture to this back one and getting an outpost here and here in two locations could help him secure the resources, but it looks like maybe he's opting just for army for securing resources in the first instance. Now, one thing to bear in mind, actually, that the one trouble for Sassy is going to have to react to what his opponent's doing because, you know, Chukunu is just going to be enough here. As long as he can get the numbers up, he'll be fine. The Spearman doesn't really add too much here for Sassy because, of course, he's not going up against any stable unit so if Jiwe spots the spearman i think Jiwe could be pretty happy and just just going for chukunu mass chukunu should be fine he might even look to get some horsemen but you know if he wants to just focus on chukunu it could be okay as long as he tries to gap close the issue going against going up, up against rather the english is you, you want to the def, the fights are decisive right you can't just you can't just push out willy-nilly if you lose a fight against the english things can snowball if you win a fight against the english well, they can still snowball, but in your favor. I want to see, interestingly, if uh, Sassy will send a villager out just to get an outpost forward or not. I want to see how much he's going to commit to this. He's looking to get those outposts up. And bear in mind, the outposts uh, are cheaper now. Well, does he have the Song Dynasty? Doesn't quite just yet, actually. Staying in the Tang Dynasty, which is an interesting one. There have been some plays actually with the Jushi Legacy to stay in the Tang Dynasty, get a cheaper Castle Age, if he so wishes. It looks like he wants to be pushing out now with the Chukunu. Doesn't have any Blacks with upgrades, but neither of them do really. This is what we're talking about, being able to gap close, take decisive fights like this, like Sassy has to back away. Bear in mind the movement speed. 1.12 for the longbowman, 1.12 for the chukunu. So even on that regard, it's going to send a couple of spearmen just to tank a little bit and push away this chukunu if he can. At least buy some time for the longbowman to get away from there. Going to try and micro this as best he can, but yeah, the chukunu, if they can get close, oh, he's going to focus on the spearman first. But either way, he's going to take out some good units, at least. Longbows making the most of their range here for Sassy before the chukunu back away. Does have a good range now. A good number of these ranged units, the longbowman. Courtesy of the council, of course, it's a nice landmark for pumping out these units. 100% faster they come out compared to a normal archery range. 
And we do get this kind of yo-yo effect, a back and forth between English and whatever civilization they're playing. And of course, today is the Jushi Legacy. Chikunu about to take an engagement once again, it seems. He feels optimistic about it. Line formation coming up for both players just to maximize the damage coming out. And I feel like Sassy actually has a really good advantage in this fight. Look how many weak Chikunu numbers he's got. He's really lacking now. Could this be the start of a snowball fight here for Sassy? But an outpost going on that front line for GUA. I like that play. It's an important position to secure. That's for sure. Yeah, Blacksmith is in play for Jiwei, but nothing queued up just yet. Kind of expecting to maybe see either Steel Darrow or Iron Under Mesh. Now, if you have a choice when you're playing with Chukudu, you kind of really want the Steel Darrow first to maximize that damage output. Does snipe a uh, Chukunu there, or did he actually save that? He might have saved that just in the end. But he's going to lose a couple of numbers here, looking to get that forward outpost. Just increase that network of castle, castle bonus range to the front lines, a 20% attack speed. That could help him significantly. Looking to get the deer camp. Now, whilst the English do get cheaper farms, I do like this play. We often do see players just opt for the farms because it's a, a nice, easy thing to do. But when you do have map control like this, you know, it doesn't hurt to get the free food on the map, right? Because, I mean, sure, English farms are cheaper, but hey, not much is cheaper than free. He does get an outpost on the gold vein as well. Look at the that area. Like, yeah, he's going to go for Tang Dynasty, Fast Castle. I like this play. It's such an interesting way to play the, the Juicy Legacy. We don't often see it. And the reason why I like it is because uh, it's something I love to do, actually, because it's something different as a Juicy Legacy. Everyone expects them to be very uh, eco-based. And I think GUA is one of these players, he, he thrives on aggression. It really fits his play style to be aggressive. And I think a Castle Age here could really be catching the English off guard. They get a couple of Palace Guards nice and early. And bear in mind, although he doesn't have any barracks, actually. So just looking to maybe get the Veterans upgrade for the Chukunu. That's probably going to be more than enough, to be fair. One thing that's nice about the Jushi Legacy, not that he's doing it at this situation, but if he did have a couple of barracks, you can start to build up Palace Guard numbers in the Feudal Age. Because, of course, you, have, you start off with early Palace Guards, and then you would have to upgrade them, of course. Outpost in a nice spot. And this outpost, by the way, is game-changing. With this out, Without this outpost, it would be a lot more difficult. I mean, he's still going to be pushed away from gold, to be fair. But he's going to make Sassy pay for it. He's going to make him lose some units, and it's possibly going to go out to gold once again. Either way, he's got up to the Castle Age, and I wouldn't be surprised to see... The old veterans coming out for the Chukunu. Looks like Siege Engineering coming out for the English and Sassy. So he's really going to look to try and push this on now. It feels like he kind of has to because he's so away from the Castle Age himself. That really, if he doesn't push now, it allows GUA to really take advantage of that Castle Age power spike. And the fact that now he's got a Shaolin Monastery as well. He's going to be able to get those relics. And any breathing space that Sassy gives away now is going to be very painful. Does pick up a village or two on that wood line, which is a start. It's a good start. We'll have to see how. He, it feels like he has to commit now at this point. And he's going to do just that. Villagers going to get another out, uh, lumber camp, rather. Okay, fair enough. Just moving away from the forward wood lines, which you're kind of expecting to see. This is a rough situation. He does need that farming transition at kind of an awkward time as well. Kind of at the time he wants to be pushing. And this is where the Jushi Legacy really show their power, right? Like, he's played one town center just as the English have. But having access to the Meditation Gardens, free resources effectively, it's a really powerful thing. And bear in mind that uh, to get the arrow slits, or the, yeah, to get the hand cannon slits, rather, he doesn't need to mine any stone. He's been getting the stone passively, and this is another reason why the Jushi Legacy are so strong. They can effectively get relatively free hand cannon slips. We'll lose the forward outpost, but this buy is valuable time. And Jukunu haven't really been upgraded just yet. We'll have to see what he's opting for. Going for an SDBs first, which does offer a lot of value. It's going to be tricky for Sassy to deal with that. No real counter to it at this stage. That's going to go for two Nestabees. So Mass Siege, he is supervising that Siege Workshop as well. Oh, it looks like he's going to go for Mass si uh, Siege with the, the Nestabees. Could be very problematic. Going on the west side, Sassy trying for a double-pronged attack from the west and the east, but really, how does he deal with the Nesta Bees? Trying to get close up to them, but the Longbows, they're trying to use the range, but he's going to get a couple of shots off here, Jiwei. It's such a risky business trying to micro down the Nesta Bees like that. Yeah, and this this has really gotten difficult for Sassy, I've got to say. A matchup that's difficult, and it's proving to be the case in game number two. 
Looks like GUA could be on course to get a win here. An equalizer set, we'll have to see. A message in chat. Love these show matches. Thank you for casting. You're very welcome. I mean, thank you for Andy and, and the viewers as well. Obviously, you guys watching there, but especially Andy for putting up the prize pool for it. Because, of course, without that, show matches wouldn't happen. But this is a... I love watching these show matches, I've got to say. Best of five. Especially with these two types of players being played, playing on uh, different maps and, and the civilizations they've picked. Of course, this is game number two, so plenty of action still heading our way. And the Nester B is pushing away that outpost. That outpost is going to be burnt to the ground relatively soon. And yeah, I, I guess at this stage, there's not much that Sassy can do about this in the feud lane. So he is opting to go to that castle age relatively soon. Looks like he is massing up stables as well, looking to get ready for a night transition. Yeah, the issue is he's just so far away from that car stage, right? He does have a bit of a standing army, but you've got to think about how effective that standing army is going to be. And up against the Nesta B, it's going to be tricky. It looks like actually Jiwei looking to play is a bit more passive, looking to get some palisade walls up. I'm a bit surprised by that. I'm pretty surprised that he's not pushing out a little bit quicker. Maybe he's looking to do so now. Getting an outpost in the front. Adding in a couple of mana times, which will scale decently well for the English in the car stage with a couple of upgrades. A double patch of mill farms eight farms on each one so gonna be getting good food economy you can see the food economy is actually looking very nice 800 food per minute nester bees are gonna be attacked by the uh manitaza i mean the the chicken will take care of that of course and he will survive with three nester bees this is a fight that i think sassy can't take but he feels maybe he has to i don't think he knows about the nester bees this could be painful he's gonna lose a decent chunk of the army or at least hp off them it backs away it's always scary to see those Nesta B shots, i got to say, if you're playing as English. He's backing away. Bear in mind, though, those sacred sites, well, he's going to be decapped, but I was taken a little bit earlier. One relic in the bag for the Jushi legacy, which is a good start. Villager goes down on the outpost there, and the outpost won't go up anytime soon. Here come a couple of horsemen. Just to buy some time, maybe we can try and get wrap around on those uh, the Nesta Bs. I actually really like that play by Sassy, i got to say. Because he realizes he needs to do something about this fast. He can't really rely on getting the Castle Age first. And he has invested in some horsemen. Obviously, it's a bit of a trade-off because obviously it's a high food cost on that. But he probably feels it's better to try and get some horsemen to try and survive rather than to die straight up. Longbow trying to gap close on those Nestabees. But the Nestabees still get a good shot off. I mean, they've been split up. He will lose the Nestabees eventually. The question is whether they got the value. I mean, he got some value from them. But losing them was pretty uh, disastrous there for GUA. So, nice pushback, i got to say, for Sassy. He's not out of this. Not out of this just yet, especially with that list of going down. Massive pickoffs for him. Clutch play for going for the horseman, i got to say. I was half expecting him to just go straight for the fast castle. Or the, well, not fast castle, but go straight to the castle age. But the horseman, it feels like it saved him a little bit. He's going to take the engagement now. He does have iron undermesh as well, so going to tank a little bit against the Chukunu. Which are still feud laid units at this stage. No upgrade on them for the veterancy, so this is a good fight for him, i got to say. Gotta be careful about the bald man though. They can pack a punch. Long Bowman getting involved. Oh, this is an issue though. The two lines is coming out the best possible time for the Juicy Legacy. We'll pull most of this army back here, Sassy, but this is might get a couple of hits off on the retreating army. Does get a couple of Long Bowmen right behind this. Uh, the question is, what does Sassy go for in terms of landmarks? Does he go for the King's Palace or the White Tower? It feels like King's Palace is a little bit risky in this situation, but it will give him a strong economy. White Tower will give him a bit more sense of uh, protection, maybe on the gold veins. We'll have to see what it looks to go for. It's going to go for the King's Palace and look to eco it up. And I think the King's Palace is very rarely a wrong choice, to be fair. It's a, a sec essentially a free town center. And the English do have some good, strong defensive capabilities. So it won't necessarily feel bad about having to defend with the English. It's not a civilization you necessarily hate defending with. As long as you can get the army numbers out. But plenty of food coming in for the Jushi Legacy. Now, bear in mind... Jiwe might opt for the Song Dynasty before he starts a farming transition. I mean, ultimately, I feel like the big, biggest power spike for the Song Dynasty really is that farming transition. So it kind of makes sense to wait for the farming transition before he gets that. Might be relatively soon, though. And the only other crazy thing you could do with this with the Tang Dynasty is a relatively fast Imperial behind this, but it's probably unlikely. Having said that, it's Ji Wei. So you never quite know. Lance is just delaying that tech up just a little bit. He knows about it. He's going to be pushed away with a couple of spearmen there. 
As a sacred site in the south, two relics have been brought back home already for GUA. Quite possibly working on the third and the fourth. Horseman though, working on the uh, the Shaolin monks. Has now got to the castle H here, Sassy. Looks like plenty of barracks coming down, so maybe Man at Arms is a nice play. Looks like GUA looking to mine some stone, maybe opting to match the second town centre effectively by getting a second town centre of his own. Has got plenty of wood. It feels like maybe he's opting to think of... Yeah, it looks like he's gearing up towards that farming transition, right? There's no explanation for hoarding that much wood. We'll have to see exactly when he starts to... I mean, this is a nice spot. He needs to keep this protected, though. There's a boar and deer camp. And if he can get an Imperial official there, that could be a crazy amount of food coming in. Also, is just keeping the longbows back at home. Looking to get the sacred site in the north and the one in the middle, actually. Back at home. Got plenty of gold left. A thousand. And also that secondary gold vein. He's pushing on the front lines here, GUA. Denying the gold, actually, for Sassy. That's actually a big issue. We have to really talk about gold for the English because that gold vein is under pressure for quite some time. And he's obviously going to need that gold for Castle Age units. And SDB is relatively unprotected. Horseman might dive on that, although Cavalry might get in the way. Will he pick this off, actually? He might just. SDB does fire off, gets a decent amount of damage on the spear, and he backs away, or he loses the Horseman, in fact. In fact. GUA will keep that Nestor Bees alive, which is really quite important. Helps sustain the push. Going to get the six right in the middle. Plenty of gold coming in that way. Yeah, this is looking issue an issue for Sassy. The fact that he put the King's Palace back at home, it's a relatively safe location, but he doesn't really have a safe gold. It means he has to rely on the units that, well, don't cost any gold. He's opting for a decent number of crossbows to push away the lances, which will help for now. Oh no, that's a big problem for Sassy. Going to lose a lot of villagers on that gold and... I love the way that GUA just makes sure he looked at where the gold positions are. And he's going to lose a lot there. Lost 19 in total so far. Cycling around the back with a couple of lances. The raiding has been so much. It's caused so much damage for Sassy. Oh, just absolute dead bodies. 45 villagers. And having a second town centre here. Hasn't been able to maintain the villager count. At least he's lost so many. Trying to get the gold. And it has... Really turned into a game where gold was an issue and it's like been a key resource that Sassy hasn't been able to get. But a good job by GUA just to deny it, really. That's got all three sacred sites, so gold is definitely not an issue for GUA. Coming in almost 1,000 per minute, only 90 per minute. Coming in for Sassy, trying his best to get the gold in the forward position. But yeah, the gold spawns, they've been tricky for the English, actually, in this game. Round on the back. Oh, those villagers on the farms. I mean, he does have the second armor upgrade as well for the ranged attack. And so he'll be happy diving underneath the town centers. It's not a problem. Killing villagers left, right, and center. And how does Sassy push out from this? It's really tricky. Most of his army is mostly infantry, so it doesn't really have the movement speed either. Yeah, pressure building up here for GUA. And it feels really difficult for Sassy to push out. I mean, he's going to push out down the southwest, being drawn out really by a couple of lancers. Leaves them exposed on the front. I mean, perhaps Palisade Walls could be an option just to try and limit the mobility of the Jushi Legacy Army in his base. But he has to get out of there. And then, of course, it is a wood investment. Speaking of wood investment, not needed that second uh, landmark for the Song Dynasty just yet. No farming transition. Did opt for a second town center. In that strong position of the deer and the boar. Boar mostly uh, taken, the food taken there, more, more or less, and so farming transition might be needed. Now, that might give Sassy a bit of breathing space. The military presence on the map might be a little bit less forthcoming for the Jushi Legacy whilst he needs a farming transition, but this is, you never really want to rely on that as the uh, the enemies to the Jushi Legacy. You know, if you're, if you're banking on your enemy having to go for the farming transition, you know you're in a tough spot. Does have a market looking just to rebalance that economy slightly. Bear in mind, the timer for the sacred site is ticking away. Seven and a half minutes on that clock. Pressurizing the front lines and taking out some production buildings, which is not ideal for Sassy because he's going to have to replace those. And yeah, it looks like GUA just going to ride on through, just absorb the arrow fire. Allows his civilization back at home just to build that economy up. It's floating so much wood though. He's going for the Zhang Nang Tower. So, yeah, that farming transition is going to come in. And, I mean, 
if you yeah and the, the farmer is not really going to hurt him actually to be honest because the farms are so cheap now the song dynasty coming in and he's got so much wood in the bank anyway he's really not going to struggle to produce army speaking of army three nest bees are pretty exposed might need to back away although actually maybe not just push it on forward five nest bees and plenty of cavalry this is going to be a tall order does have a couple of well just one spring or that does go down to the nest bees itself and that's always a, a sore sight when your nest bees are taking out your your spring olds. yeah you can't get close here sassy There's just too many of them six and a half minutes on that ticking timer of the sacred site it's going to be a strong win condition possibility for GUA. Song Dynasty is in, so probably expecting those farms to pop out soon. He's kind of struggling on that food, actually. It's kind of a resource that he needs. He's holding back for now. And there is that farming transition coming in the blink of an eye. You can see he dropped so many farms and it barely took off any wood off him. So much more wood to go. And all he needs to do is build that up. And bear in mind, the villagers do build faster for the Jushi legacy. So it's going to come up in no time. Cheaper farms, faster building farms. What more could you want? Sassy, though, has had some breathing space for at least a minute or two. And he has actually got the Palisade walls up on this west side. So we'll limit the range of uh, or areas of attack points for Sassy. But at this point... He looks like he uh, might just be pushed down the middle. He's looking to neutralize the sacred site. Might actually neutralize this. So GUA not really opting for that sacred site victory win condition. Unless he sends something there very quickly. Looks like instead he's looking to take his opponent out with plenty of siege. At this point in the game, 25 minutes, this is really where siege becomes prominent. I'm not so sure about the capabilities of the English to match that siege that the Jushi Lexi have. Cavalry just moving around the right side. I was looking to torch that down, but plenty of spearmen there to protect. The only issue is that slowly but surely, that siege ball for the Jushi Legacy and GUA are moving forward. Looks like might be the last stand coming out for Sassy at some point. It's 20 villagers behind. And the farms, they look so good for the Jushi Legacy. That food income skyrocketing. 1,600 now. 1,700. 1,800. And it's going to be rising. Yeah, there we go. 2,000 food per minute, 1,200 gold per minute. Resources coming in thick and fast for the Jushi Legacy. That economy looking incredibly strong, and that's just going to fuel the army. English dying slowly at this point. And maybe the Springles could get some value, but there's only two of them. Nesta is going to focus on the Springles, get some good damage. He does survive with one of them. Village is coming out to repair. Lancers. Tanking that front line against many of those spearmen. But the nest of bees focus on the spearmen. That army could die in a blink of an eye. And it does just that. Two springles still working hard. We'll take out a lot of nest of bees. But still four remain. And he's cleared out the army. Sassy down to 12 army. Six army. And the cavalry just looked to take out those springles. And there it is then, gentlemen. Game number two goes in the way of GUA. He has tied up the set. As we head on to game number three. He's going to be heating up, ladies and gents. This best of five is no by no means over. All right, let's get the score updated. But uh, interesting opening, good matchup. I mean, I think it's always a bit tricky for the English in this one. The Jushi Legacy, yeah, incredibly strong. But of course, it's one thing about having a, a strong civilization. It's another thing actually seeing the game out. When you uh, talk about these two players of how highly ranked they are and how skilled they are, it's not just a case of picking up your civilization and winning. You've got you to gotta see it through and, and do what you've got to do. So GUA evens up the set. One apiece. We head into game number three. Alrighty, it's going to be Japanese versus the HRE. The map is Bridges, by the way, which I've, it's going to be the first time casting a match on Bridges. It's going to be exciting because uh, it's one of these new maps, actually, that I haven't seen a lot of. So I'm excited to see something different, something new. So here we go. All right, welcome everyone to game number three. We've got Sassy spawning on the west side in blue as the Japanese. And we've got GOA on the east side in red as the Holy Roman Empire. Welcome everyone to Bridges. If it's the first time you're watching this map, 
Well, you've got bridges, as the name suggests, and the bridges lead to, well, I guess two mini islands. Mainly in the north, you've got Deer Camp, and you've got two gold veins and a relic and a stone miner, and also a sacred site. In the south, you also got a sacred site. And uh, not much else, mostly a relic. So sacred sites really is what defines this map in terms of the bridges separating the mainland from the peripherals. Uh, kind of interesting matchup, I've got to say. Japanese versus the HRE, two civilizations that can thrive heavily in that mid game. That kind of 15 minute mark is where they both come online. And regardless of what strategy they go for, by the way, like, you know, Japanese, they can open up two town centers, they can go for a relatively greedy kind of play into Castle Age. And either way, the 15 minute mark is where they come online and with military production, it can be very strong. HRE, very similar. You know, if they go for a Regulus Cathedral build, again, 12, 15 minutes is where they come online. It's when they look to get the relics, get the good income, and then translate into military. If they go for the Burgraf kind of madness, get the sort of similar timing so that they can really pack a punch. So we're kind of expecting a lot of action in that 15 minute mark. And the kind of question is, how do they get there? The HRE getting plenty of sheep, which is important, of course. Their prelate boosting up the gather rate of their villagers quite significantly does mean they rip through their resources very quickly. You can see a 40% buff there on the inspired villagers. The Japanese, in many ways, have a really good food economy themselves, regardless of you know, having any sort of inspired units. The Kura Storehouse, a really nice landmark, getting them free farms. It really allows them to, I guess, preferentially put villagers on food. They don't have to focus on wood for farming transition early. They don't have to even go out to the mid-map objectives or mid-map food of the deer camp at all. They can just... Kind of stay at home, slowly transition to a, a farm that con a farming economy that's free. Now bear in mind, actually, the Japanese have opted for going on the berries nice and early, and they've got the early wheelbarrow upgrade or mini wheelbarrow upgrade, baby wheelbarrow upgrade, I like to call it, to increase the gather rate on berries. And so, food is never really an issue for the Japanese. Get the berries nice and early, then get the free farms from the Kura storehouse. In the meantime, they can rely on the sheep that they bring at home. Back at home, though, gee, we're going up with the minework palace which is an interesting approach. I have seen the HRE actually do this a little bit more often. It's kind of curious because, of course, the Arkin Chapel has a 40% bonus. Obviously, you jump in a, the, the Arkin Chapel with the Prelate and you kind of expand the radius that it works. I, I'd, I'd like the landmark choice. I, Minework Palace has often been seen as a meme, but the reason why I like it is because it offers you upgrades that you can't get anyway, any other way. And the Arkin Chapel, the bonus it gives you, well, you can always train more prelates, right? It's one of the situations where actually going for the Minework Palace gives you something you can't get any other way. And it's a, an interesting choice. Maybe it's looking to be aggressive in the feud later. We've seen that a little bit with the HRE. Now, they do have a strong economy. So if you want to extend the feud age, they can, they can definitely do that. Uh, it's not something they often do, but they do often posture towards that castle age timing and... It's kind of an exciting way to see the HRE being played. Maybe he's going to go for an extensive feudal age. We'll have to see. Bear in mind the Japanese do get access to stone as they mine gold and vice versa. So if he does need to get some static defenses with some arrowslits, it's always an option for him. He's going to go for the Kuro Storehouse. No real surprises there for the Japanese. It has pulled a couple of villages away from berries, looking to go into wood, maybe get a couple of production buildings. Setting a spearman nice and early as well. Dark Age spearman. Interesting. Looks like he really wants to pack a punch. We don't see this all this often, but of course with the economy that the HRE get, they get f food very nicely and quickly. As you can see, 400 food per minute coming in, so it does allow the funding of these units. But bear in mind, there is a timing where the HRE start to struggle with food. When they run out of the sheep, they have to venture out on the map. And one of the reasons why I actually like the aggressive play for the HRE is because if you do want to venture on the map, you've got to have map control. And one way of getting map control is by getting units. So it's one of these kind of circular things where if you get more units, it gives you more map control, it gives you more access to resources on the map. And then it gives you more units. Look at to pressurize that gold vein. And they will have to back away... Curious to see Sassy so heavily on gold, actually, whether that's for upgrades or if he's looking for a castle age sort of issue. The timing, we'll have to see. Either way, he's going to be pushed off gold now. He doesn't really have an outpost here or any way of getting one anytime soon. So we'll have to take into, well, we'll have to place down a barracks and get some units out relatively quickly. Going to go for the honor Bagatia, which I like to see because he will have the movement speed and the mobility. Quite a few sheep for Sassy. 
He needs to be careful about that, actually. He doesn't want to lose that scout. It, wait, he's got to be... Yeah, I, I don't think... Uh, this is just no risk it. Don't risk it. He's backing away. And rightly so. Can't afford to lose that many sheep. Despite having three farms. I mean, this is a lot of sheep. And he does bring them home. Keeps them safe and secure on a big airship. In many ways, it's just a far superior unit to the Spearman. So it's a nice choice of unit for Sassy. They could protect that goal vein and push the Spearman away. Doesn't necessarily have to be aggressive with these units, as long as it protects that gold vein. Now bear in mind, a relatively cheap wood investment into Palisades to between these two wood lines to the edge of the map could offer Sassy a lot of protection on that gold vein. Something that quite possibly he'd want to do. Man at Arms coming out. My work Palace does give him access to three abilities, marching drills, increasing the movement speed of infantry by 10% and religious units, as it happens. Does have riveted chain mail, which increases the melee armor of spearmen and horsemen. Also steel barding in the castle age. Grants the knights two melee and two ranged armor. So could look to uh, get some of those upgrades relatively soon. Getting the first melee attack upgrade for the spearmen. But the Onbegay should be fine at dealing with this. Also can gap close, of course. The movement speed 1.5 tiles per second versus 1.25. So the Onbegay a lovely unit in the situation, I've got to say. Yeah, it actually really hurts this kind of attempt from GUA for the few Dark Age aggression. Manatons will be a bit better at dealing with the uh, the Undergation, but he's got to mass them up, as he does now. I actually went for Iron Undermesh as well, which will help him tank against the Town Center Fire, but I did suspect he's going to be heading that way anytime soon. And Sassy looks like he's going to ignore that army and get a bit of a counter raid of himself. And yeah, this is an issue, because like, if you think about what GOA is trying to do in this match, he's trying to put some pressure on so he can get the free resources on the map in terms of the Deer Camp. I mean, it's tough when you go up against a civilization that has one of the best raiding units in the game. And that is the Onabagasia. Does now get an outpost in that gold vein, but the amount of time is going to be still putting some pressure on, and Deer Camp at the back is being pressurized as well. But the amount will be taken down. We have to see exactly where the Onabagasia are. There they are. Heading towards that deer camp, so there's a good pick off. Now, Jiwei does have an outpost which will buy him some time with the villagers, but the villagers will be idled nevertheless. And with Iron Undermesh, he should be able to get away with a couple of the Onabagashas still alive. And he does just that. Just a question in chat what this map is called? It's called Bridges. It's a nice new map. I mean, I'm kind of excited for when you see new maps like this because it changes things up, it revamps things a little bit. Although, i got to say, the, the main focal point in terms of the bridges probably doesn't really come into effect until the mid to late game. Which we might end up seeing, actually, in this one. Wheelbarrow coming in for the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, it looks like he's maybe posturing towards the castle. I mean, where are these villages off to? Yeah, it looks like the deer camp. He wants to he wants to get the map. He wants to get the food on the map whilst he still can, I guess. On Abgesha, always still... Pressurizing and keeping an eye on things. But bear in mind, Japanese look for a really good castle age time. I think this is something that's actually really strong with the Japanese. Their, their castle age timing, it's, it's very hard to deny it as well. Like, when you think about denying castle age times for various civilizations, if you're going up against the HRE, you know, pressurizing the gold, pressurizing food, external food resources like this is important. Bear in mind, the Japanese don't have to rely on external food resources. They just get the farms for free relatively quickly. And so, one of the two key resources, of course, being food, is, is, is so easy to get for the Japanese. So really, all they need to do from then on is protect that gold. It does have a good amount of resources coming in from the deer. The villages are backing away, but it, I get the feeling that marching drills is in, by the way. Which makes it a little bit easier to gap close. It is indeed in. And that castle edge could have coming out a decent time. Floating gate landmark is the choice. No real surprises there. It's a really nice power spike for the Japanese, actually, because they get even more resources passively with the Yorishiro. Now they can put them inside production buildings as well if they want to be particularly aggressive, but we do often see them place the Yorishiro inside the uh, the forges to get the extra bit of gold, which is a, a resource that they kind of need in the Castle Age. Of course, you want to get the Castle Age units, the heavily armored units, whether it be Samurai or the Mounted Samurai. We shall see exactly what Sassy has in mind. Now bear in mind the HRE are no slouches to get to the Castle Age themselves. Got to go up the Reckless Cathedral and look to get some of those relics. And this is where having control of those bridges might come into play. 
just to make sure we can get those relics. Pick off a couple of archers. And the Onobagasha with their attack speed, the movement speed, is such a good unit for the Japanese in the feudal age. And bear in mind the Japanese behind this are looking to get the Daimyo Manor upgrade, which is going to be fantastic again for that food economy. Going to be increasing the gather rate on the farms by 25%. Also granting an extra villager, making the town center a bit more robust as well. The GOA does get to the Castle Age and can train some prelates theoretically from the Rakes Cathedral, which will maybe counteract some of the benefits he could have gotten from the Ark and Chapel. Might need to get a couple more prelates and spread them around. Just give me a couple of units there on the deer camp just to make sure that that food isn't coming in easily for the Japanese. A nice couple of units being left here for Jiwei just to protect that, re uh, that relic. The first relic coming in here for Jiwei. Doesn't seem like uh, Sassy can deny that really. And the good thing for Jiwei and the HRE, he does have two relics pretty much in his grasp back at home. He's protecting a third. Does have the two relics obviously on the other side of the bridges. Although he did have one. That's been nabbed already. In fact, the Yorishi are going inside the barracks, so Sassy looking to be aggressive. Try and pump out units to try and establish himself on the map a bit better. Oh, Outpost was going up. I mean, he should get a couple of villagers here. Great play. It's taken two so far. About to get a third. A couple of archers will take out the Onobagation. Now, the Onobagation are pretty much countered. By the archers, but I mean, he's killing so many. He's got so much value. I mean, they paid for themselves already. There's no doubt about that. Looking to get the relic here in the southwest area of the map here. Sassy picks it up and heads on back home. Welcome everyone on the Twitch chat. How's it going, Byzantine? No uh, prizes for guessing what your favorite civilization, I imagine. Hope you're all doing well. And if you're watching on YouTube, just to let you guys know, I have been streaming a lot more on Twitch these days, so it's worth checking it out if you're interested. I'll leave a link in the video description to let you know where we can be found casting games. Mounted Samurai pops out, and I like this choice of unit, actually, because you can see a heavy posturing of Jiwei into infantry-based units, including Man at Arms and a Katana Bannerman popping out, just to help out the uh, Samurai, regular Samurai, too. Veterans the Upgrade comes in with them as well. I love the addition of the Katana Bannerman, i got to say. Increases the infantry damage by 15%. Well mounted samurai. Takes the man at arms out. And like unit numbers wise. And the quality of units. I do favor the Japanese. And the situation they're in. It looks like the Japanese also. With the farming transition already in play. Makes it very difficult for the HRE. Of course they don't have that comparative advantage. They're going to have to rely on. Heavy wood investment into farms eventually. Because he's struggling to get the food off the map right. Like, it gives you a target point as a Japanese in the situation to target the food on the map. And if you do that, you're really going to hurt the HRE's capability of producing army. You can see the food income coming in at almost it's under 200 per minute for Jiwei. Looking really tricky. Charging in, takes out a man of times relatively quickly. Is on the ball in the south, but if this is an area that... Sassy looks to pressure, which he is. Again, it means more idle villages, more idle economy, and a sheer lack of food. Coming in the south, I mean, I love the way the Sassy's playing this, actually. He's keeping pockets of army, always denying the food pockets on the map, and he recognizes that's a big issue for the HR at this point, getting food. And it could be a big way to help him win the game here, Sassy, i got to say. Now, three relics in play, though, for the HRE with the Rickers Cathedral. One option for the HRE is to get a market down and just buy the food that it might need in the meantime to pump out units. Mounted Samurai diving in a little bit. Again, keeping food villagers idle. You can see the intention here for Sassy. He's targeting the food economy from the HRE. And he's doing it incredibly well. Do you see the Yorishiro inside a forge now? So speaking of gold, it's going to be decent income coming in from the Japanese as well. Contesting the sacred site in the south. And boar has been taken. Now, this is actually a key bit of detail. There's only four villages, but the boar is something he's relying on heavily. I do fear for Jiwei. The reason why is because he's going to need a relatively hard farming transition at some point, relatively soon. And what that allows is for Sassy to keep up pumping out units. He's got his farming transition essentially done. He's actually got two free farms he could take advantage of. 
So there's going to be a timing window for the Japanese, certainly, where they can keep pumping out units, whereas Jiwei is going to have to invest in a long-term economy fix for the farms. Mounted Samurai getting on the wood line. Again, idling 15 villagers. He's killed 14 so far, and he's just suffocating him in a big way. The HRE have found it difficult to stabilize that economy. He's always being pressurized. He did try that Dark Age aggression, but didn't necessarily do as much damage as he would have wanted to. Veteran horsemen being added in as well. And that's a clear purposeful move, by the way. When you consider the army compositions that have been chosen so far, obviously Sassy opted for the, on a big age, but then he teched into heavily armoured units in terms of the mounted samurai and samurai. So he's probably expecting crossbows to be on the field, and the horsemen will take care of those two crossbows. And of course, the perfect counter to crossbows will be those horsemen, so Sassy feels just a little bit ahead of the uh, the army choices here. There is a knight on the field for GOA, but doesn't really have the ascendancy in terms of dictating the terms of what army wants to choose. It feels like Jiwei having to be a bit more reactive than the Japanese. Sacred Sight in the north, in control of the Japanese, and this was going to deny that Sacred Sight in the south. So, yeah, every little mini battle here is certainly going in the way of the Japanese. Jiwei, he's up against it. But with four relics in play, there's always a chance, you feel, for the HRE. Yep, our Byzantine fellow in chat mentioning about the Japanese town centre. It is a very strong upgrade they get, the Damian Manor. Not only does it boost that economy, but makes the town centre incredibly tanky. So not that, you know, Jiwei is going to be pressurising the town centre anytime soon. At least not by the looks of it. If you do try and pressurise the Japanese town centre, it can be very difficult to take out. And speaking about taking out, it's going to take out a good few villagers here. Maybe just, in fact, maybe not. The army is in position here for Jiwei. Does have a couple of lands Kanesh as well. And that's not a fight that Sassy wants to take. He's going to be completely outnumbered. That's a good pushback by GOA. He's going to need a couple more of these. And if he can get a couple more of these types of fights, it could put him in a good spot. Lance Kanesh going to be ripping through a lot of those mounted samurai. Also coming on the back line, trying to get on top of those archers and crossbows if they can. Crossbows working on the mounted samurai. Samurai trying to back away. I mean, that's a good cleanup here for GOA. This is exactly what he needed. Could this be the start of something special? Because he needed a fight like this. For long periods of time in this game, he's been under fire, under pressure. All of a sudden, though, two good fights in a row, and he's starting to put some pressure on. He does need to decap the sacred sites. That's going to be another important aspect of this game. Because that free gold income for the Japanese is looking really good. Only one relic, but bear in mind he does have Yorishiro to use in the forges, of which there are two so far. Wouldn't be surprised to see a couple more, potentially. But on the back of this, Jiwei, he feels confident to push out. Will he have enough? I, I'm not so sure. I think the defender's advantage, especially the fact he's got Yorishiro inside the barracks, it should really help Sassy in this fight. And I think the last thing you want is Jiwei is to, is to overcommit and overpush out. And he might have just done that, although he's backing away now and Sassy's not chasing. Going in the north. Oh, this is a nice pick off here by GOA, keeping an eye on things and making sure the deer camps aren't easy to take. And there's going to be a good few dead villagers here. He's pulling his boy back into the game, GOA. And this is, this is why these two players are incredibly highly skilled. They've always got just something up their sleeves sometimes to get back into the game, and GOA is doing just that. Bear in mind, the series at the moment is 1 1, so it's all to play for. Whilst this game isn't a match winning game it's definitely going to be helpful to win this one looks like sassy not interested in taking that fight understandably so when you factor in a couple of lands in there trying to break through on the south side burning on through that's a fight that sassy would love to take GOA just cycling around the north to see what value can get but there's not much to be had looks like it might be grouping down in the middle and wonder whether we'll start to see some rams or any other siege heading on the map soon. We're kind of heading to that 20 minute of the mark of the game. I generally have a... Oh, that's a nice bit of warding off to try and keep the economy safe or at least trap him out of the sacred site. Oh, the wall doesn't go up in time. Or well, the gate didn't, at least, and he killed a couple of villagers. The frontline gold is being idled quite heavily. And that's actually a potential win condition for GOA because he has 
mined out that primary gold vein, Sassy. The other gold vein he has is relatively far forward. Uh, one could think the Japanese does have the Yorishiro inside the forges, but still, he, he'll be limited in terms of gold income. I think this could be an issue for the Japanese. If the Holy Roman Empire pressurizes this area, it could slowly become an issue, but speaking about that, pressure. Looks like Sassy is pressurizing. Sometimes you can say that the best form of defense is aggression, and Sassy's doing just that. The army split here for GUA. I wonder if he's going to try and come around the back to cut off any sort of retreat. A couple of mounted samurai and horsemen going on the back just to deny a bit of farming economy. A decent farming transition here for GUA, but a lot of it's idle at this point, and food has always been a bit of a problem for him in this game, and it continues to be so. A couple of lands can actually try to get some value around the back. He might actually go into that stone vein. That could be painful if Sassy's not paying attention. Still, a couple of mounted samurai. Making sure the villagers are keeping an eye on things. Pushing on that front line. It feels like he actually has a lot of army here, Sassy. In this forward position. Two lands can actually working on the farms on the Cura storehouse. Backing away for now. and Could be getting value there. We'll have to keep an eye on that in just a moment. But looks like on the front, Sassy still pressurizing, giving himself some breathing space. I think the uh, Lanskin actually went down there in the end, unfortunately for him. But he's really starting to pump out. Like, we know one thing about the Japanese is once they start going in terms of army production, they can really start to pump them out, and it feels like he's heading to that situation. A decent number of units here for GUA, so should push this back for a while, but we can see the blue units trickling along the map, and... Eventually that will build up. He just needs to make sure he doesn't lose a critical mass of units on a retreat. GUA trying to buy himself some space as much as possible. Crossbows on the back line. He's taking the fight, Sassy. Coming to fight this with the Honor Bagatia as well. I mean, this is going to be a decent fight for Sassy, I think. He needs to take out the Lance Condition if he can. Range units going to be chopped down by the movement speed of the Honor Bagatia. The Mounted Samurai. Only one of them or two of them are getting some value. On the Geisha fighting over the shoulders of the samurai. This is what they do best. And I think maybe Sassy just edged... Well, no, maybe the Lance Ganesha actually ripping through that northern part of that fight. I think this could be a decent cleanup. Although, it's a bit difficult to tell. He's backing away GUA. He doesn't want to fight just yet because the reinforcement's coming in. Like, despite GUA technically should have the defender's advantage. When you see a stream of blue units come across the map, it feels like actually the defender's advantage doesn't count as much. And Sassy... He's getting a lot of map positioning. He's got the sacred site in the south. Sacred site in the north being captured by HRE though at this point. I like the peeling of a couple of units here for GUA. Just always giving Sassy a problem to think about. And one thing to consider is GUA has kind of funneled everything to come towards this middle area. So it does allow him to defend a little bit easier, but when you're coming up against Siege now, this is going to be an issue. Bear in mind, GUA is really struggling on that wood. So he's not going to be able to afford Siege himself anytime soon, not unless that food economy really starts to escalate. And the farming transition well underway. Bear in mind now with the Daimyo Palace. It's getting a decent upgrade. 50% increased harvest rate on these farms. Bear in mind that's actually starting to, you know, outstrip what the prelates can do for the HRE. It looks like Sassy is starting to mount a response again. A big push coming in with the Manganel this time. This could be an issue. It does have a couple of horsemen popping out, which is going to be helpful for... GUA, but it's going to have to find a way to get on top of those mangonels, of which there are now there are two. Could be double trouble. Neutralizing the sacred site in the north, and we'll capture that with the Shinto priest as well, so possibly looking towards a sacred site victory, although GUA looking to get the southern one. Starting to build up a massive army, GUA. It feels like actually you might be heading to a situation in the game where it can take one big fight. That could be very decisive, and it looks like Sassy feels confident. Keep his army forward. Does deny that outpost, and also make sure that one relic gets out of the hands of the HRE, at least for now. A 
Picking up that relic, though. Sassy's going to go for a bit of a heist. Emergency repairs won't be enough. The building will go down. Oh, loses the mounted samurai. Wait. I mean the knight. The regular knight. Starting to try and burn things down. Does have a couple of spring holes, which will help take the mangonels at least. Mangonels deployed. Do get a couple of hits off the... Uh, they have to back away there, actually. I don't think he quite has enough. This could be dangerous. I mean, two springles won't be enough to deal with two mangonels, at least for the short term. He might be able to get a couple of hits off of those mangonels before they go down. That's always a concern if you're GUA at this point. Does have the sick side of the north, at least. So a bit of gold trickle coming in that way. But the food economy is just looking so good for the Japanese. Almost 2,000 per minute. At some point, he might look to just dive this. All important production buildings on the front going down. So Jiwei are going to have to reinvest wood into that. Couple of on obligation, just again trying to keep him honest, try and keep those villagers away from farming if they can. I might just try and torch everything down. It's got a lot of inventory, by the way. It's going to be able to use the torches very effectively. Now, three springles, that could be enough now. Like, here come the rams. The big concern for the HRE are the rams because, of course, if GOA focuses on the rams, that allows Sassy's army, the Japanese, to focus on the army. And yeah, those those rams will be getting free value in the meantime if they're not targeted at the same time. So it's a really big problem. Ranged army being kept behind, behind the house, trying to get into the choke points, which would favor the ranged army significantly. But Maganels, they're going to deploy. One Maganel goes down. Three Springles, of course, for the HRE. In fact, one went down, so it's limited to two now. But he's going to win that fight quite successfully, I think, Sazzy. It's just got so much. The Samurai and the Onabagasha fighting together. and I mean, he's got plenty of ranged army, but... Again, they're not going to be having much of a front line at this point, and it looks like the Japanese are going to just overrun things a little bit. Does lose the Manganel, but Rams are still working hard on the production buildings. If you get on top of the ranged army here, Sassy, he might be able to hold for a little bit longer here, GOA, but down to 46 villagers. He's been losing a couple on the back. You see a horseman and also a mounted samurai getting huge value. Onabagesha still fighting away. Emergency repairs comes out on the archery range. And that stream of blue units, it's so powerful for the Japanese. Yeah, he's going to get on top of that pretty heavily. This is an issue. The farming economy being idled at GUA. It feels like he's being overswarmed a little bit, down to 40 villagers. And this push, even if it isn't the killer blow, is just done so much economic damage. Villagers idled. So many of them running around, trying to get onto a resource they could possibly get. Get Mounted Samurai pilling in the north, and yep, 47 villagers going down so far already. Ram still working hard. Sassy coming with a big push, and it feels like even if GOA holds, there's not much of an economy to fight back with. Again, peeling off a couple of cavalry, just peeling away the minimal army that he has, GOA, and it's a good position for Sassy. Could mount another big push. You can see the sea of blue units just going across the map. Yikes. Looking to get the Seiko site in the south as well, and looking to just dominate now that mid-map objective. And slowly but surely, he's moving through a really active phase of the game. 2,400 food coming in per minute. Now that he's got the Shogun at Castle, 75% increased income from the farming economy. And that food is it's just, he's spending it all as well. That's the big thing. He's spending everything he's getting, and that's going to make so much military units. Gets all the sacred sites coming in the north with a couple of horsemen. Trying to get a surround, actually. Maybe to come around the backside to try and get the springles out. Not that it matters too much because the springles are pretty useless at this point. Could focus on the rams, I guess, but there's only one of them. Taking the fight. It doesn't really feel like GOA has enough this time. Samurai in good numbers with the Onibagesha fighting right on the back of them. This is looking tricky. 
The choke point will help GUA quite significantly between the Rex Cathedral and the Archer Range, but once the numbers start to dwindle, it will be a problem. And villagers being idled significantly, down to 30 economy units. And yeah, sure, Sassy might lose the army. But there it is, ladies and gentlemen, GUA, he just lost too much economy, couldn't find a way back, and... Well, for the second time in the series, Sassy pulls ahead. It's going to be two games to one, and it's a game number four. Alrighty, interesting game. Guys, how was the audio? I know you guys mentioned it a little bit at the end of the game, that the audio was a little bit scuffed. Was it still scuffed at the end? Hopefully not. That's kind of bad if it was. I'll reset my Age of Empires 4 game if that's the case. It's just that... But it's better now. Okay. I wonder why that was. It's kind of strange. Well, I think I know why. So, I've been thinking about how to balance the... Re We're going to head into the next game very soon. I just need to update the score. But I think it's taking a lot of resources to both stream and record as well because i'm recording in 4k and i'm streaming in 1080p and because the encoder is having to encode it two different ways like i'm having to attend having to do a 1080p broadcast and also a 4k recording it's kind of overbearing a little bit which is kind of tricky i, I, I wish like so one thing about twitch is you can only maximally uh, upload in 1080p as a an affiliate but once you get partner status you can get 1440 so obviously I'm pretty far away from getting partner status, but that would be amazing because then I could just stream in 1440 um, and then I won't have to record at the same time. I, I mean, I you know, obviously it's not as good as 4K, but it's doable, right? And then I could just download the VODs and upload it later. But yeah, it is what it is. Hopefully the audio won't be too much of a problem in the next game. Which we're going to head into next. How's it going, Fenris? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. From Norway, the land of the Viper. If you're not aware, by the way, Viper is a... I'm sure you're probably aware, but he's a very popular player for Age of Empires 2. Did dabble in Age of Empires 4 as well, actually, to be fair. Alright, so 2-1 for Sassy. We're heading to game number 4. You do know, of course you do, of course you do. Yeah, he did win a... Uh, uh, Age of Empires 4 tournament. I think, was it Golden League? I can't quite... No, it was the first one. It was Genesis, right? It was the first ever one. How's it going, I reckon? Yeah, 4K or 60 FPS, not really need to fair for... I guess it depends. Uh, the YouTube lot seem to like it a lot, so <laughs> it depends. Nimadan and Cow are from Norway too. Yeah, it looks like it. I know Cow is. I'm not sure about Nimadan, but probably. But game number four is going to be Rocky Canyon. Abbasid versus Chinese. Okay, okay, okay. One moment. We're almost there for the next game. Alrighty, friendly reminder that if you're enjoying the stream, then make sure you do drop a follow so you catch me when I'm next on. And on the YouTube side of things, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the content. Going to be getting to the last game now, so strap yourselves in, because uh, it's gonna, we're going to be in for a ride. It's going to be Rocky Canyon. Alrighty, welcome everyone to game number four in the southeast, playing in blue, we've got Sassy playing as the Chinese. And of course, as we know, his opponent in the Northwest playing in red, we've got GUA playing as the Abbasid Dynasty. Going to be building that House of Wisdom nice and early as you usually would. Now, this matchup's an interesting one because, I, like, the Chinese, uh, they're such a strong civilization. Of course, with the new variant civilizations, they tend to do things better than their parent ones. Like, when you think about Jean d'Arc, they tend to do things better than the French and the Chinese. Well, the Jushi legacy tend to do things better than them. But we're dealing with uh, the Abbasid Dynasty, so it's like a, two vanilla civilizations going toe-to-toe, -to -toe and it's an interesting one to think about because you feel like both these civilizations, they do push to towards the economy side of things. Generally, when they want to you know, think about what their strengths, well, the Abbasid Dynasty, of course, have the ability to get fresh foodstuffs and multiple town centers if they do go for the economy wing and Fertile Crescent. Can sometimes go for the military wing early to put some pressure on, but... 
you see the situation for the Chinese, they I feel like they're one of the civilizations that dictate again the, the way the match is played out. You have certain civilizations that are just so strong at what they do that realistically it's up to the opponent and the uh, the enemy civilization just to try and limit how much they can get away with. And of course with the Chinese how strong that they can be with their economy, it feels like the Abbasid dynasty have to be aggressive. The trouble is the Abbasid dynasty aren't really known for their aggression. And maybe there's a way of doing it in terms of having a mixture of economy and aggression, but generally if you go too half-hearted like that, it tends not to work out for you. Uh, one thing that could be brought into consideration, a military wing into free siege engineering could put some pressure on the Chinese, but bear in mind the Chinese have access to the Barbican of the Sun, so when you think about defensive capabilities for the Chinese, I mean, they've got a lot of capabilities. And I feel like in many ways this is a tricky matchup for the, the Ambassador Dynasty, but we'll see what the GOA can do here. Bit of a live wire gamer, of course. And uh, anything's possible. It's going to be the Imperial Academy, so it's going to be looking to be a Song Dynasty opening it for the Chinese. And maybe multiple town centers. One thing to bear in mind in the most recent patch, the town centers have been nerfed a little bit. So it's quite likely that they could get multiple town centers, but they'll probably have to place them relatively condensed. Uh, in terms of resource locations, one consideration and concern for the Chinese is the forward gold. But as we said... They do have access to the Barbican of the Sun. Now, I wouldn't be surprised to see this particular area here being protected by the Barbican of the Sun as much as possible because there's there's a lot of food, there's a lot of gold, actually. I mean, a Barbican of the Sun and an outpost or two could be really powerful. I gotta say, the map location for the Chinese is it's not ideal. It's just not ideal. Two deer camps, berries and gold all forward. You, you definitely don't really want that as a Chinese. Contrastingly, the Abbasid Dynasty have the deer camp relatively safe at the back at least and a gold vein at the back as well and a stone so i mean map generation and rng wise it does feel like the chinese really didn't get much help in that way and it is going to be the military wing for the ambassador dynasty so when we talk about pressuring and punishing the chinese i mean if you're going to punish them on a map this is the kind of map you want and that is for sure and plenty of sheep coming in for the ambassador dynasty as well now, whilst we did talk about how the Ambassador Dynasty can be relatively eco-focused out of the, you know, other civilizations comparatively, I think generally one thing to consider is the Fertile Crescent upgrade. What it allows them to do is to get cheaper villages, of course. Oh, sorry, the fresh food stuffs, rather. It allows them to get cheaper villages, of course, and then, well, they can pump more food into military. That's one thing that's got going for them in terms of aggression. The military wing coming out now for GUA. We'll give him access to a couple of units. Two archers and the uh, two spearmen. Bear in mind, we'll have access to boot camp. Increasing the health of infantry by 15%. And also composite bows. Increasing the attack speed of archers by 33%. That can be incredibly powerful. But bear in mind that... You know, again, certain bonuses, they feed well into certain matchups. And I like the infantry focus for the Ambassador Dynasty in terms of the military wing upgrades. But when you factor in the Chinese, they can get the beautiful siege they get from the clock tower. It just feels like the Chinese have the answers they need against a mass infantry play. And uh, it makes things very tricky for the Ambassador Dynasty. Going to get an archery range, so could opt for the archer line ranged units. Of course, no Song Dynasty just yet for the Chinese. Although it might be opted to do that now. Looks like it will be the Barbican of the Sun. Unfortunately for GUA, he actually went around the west side. And the scout's there as well, so he won't spot it. Although we will get the spearmen there, but it will take time for them to come on the side. Looks like four villages with the Barbican of the Sun, rather. We'll be able to build up pretty soon. You know, he's really prioritizing securing the food, and I don't hate it, because ultimately... Gold is a situation that you need when you want to think about Castle Age, which maybe is looking to a bit more of a feudal age aggression. Or at least he might look to try and protect this later on with an outpost or two. We'll have to see how he decides to play this one out. But the units for GOA unfortunately just went across the map on the opposite side they needed to be on. And the Barbican should go up in time. Especially when you factor in their archers on the way too. It's going to be a second town centre for the Abbasid Dynasty. That two town centre play with uh, without Fertile Crescent. Does he does have fresh food stuffs? So that'll be very helpful. 
the Song Dynasty now does begin. And uh, the question is whether Sassy will go for second turn set himself. It looks like he will. So, yeah, he's going to go for a second turn set. Song Dynasty also does increase the production speed of the town centers. So, 2TC Chinese Song Dynasty will just out eco a two town set of the Bassa Dynasty. And it looks like it is a posturing towards the castle age with that number of villages and gold. Gee, wait. Looking to be a bit more aggressive. And I'm kind of interested to see what timing that Sassy can achieve on his tech up to the castle age. It will be important, actually, in this matchup. Now, it hasn't actually got a production building, so it looks like it's going to go straight into the castle age behind this. It's actually quite a strong play because it has forced the Chinese back at home. Not necessarily that the Chinese are going to be aggressive anyway, to be fair. In, in many ways, the Chinese will be okay with this. But we do have to factor in a strong push from the Ambassador down to the castle age could cause trouble. Could cause problems. Yet to get that second town center, and this is what I'm talking about, how getting a second town center close to home is likely to be the play for the Chinese, be very risky to move out. Although he might place it next to the Barbican of the Sun, which is not all too bad. But I would be possibly expecting to put it on gold, because it's one key resource that he hasn't yet secured particularly well. Uh, it's a kind of an odd position, I've got to say, it's kind of halfway between the gold and the deer camp. Kind of interesting spot there, I've got to say. Wasn't anticipating that, I was kind of expecting him to put it right on top of the gold vein. Interesting choice here from Zassi. I wonder the, uh, the thought process. I guess he feels like it's maybe close enough to the gold and close enough to the food that the villagers can go, but also garrison inside the town site if they need to. Bear in mind, though, there's only seven garrison in all spots. We'll see if uh, GOA can punish that. Cold chewing is the option, so going to go to the castle age a little bit quicker, of course. Well, not quicker, rather, but he'll be able to possibly get preservation knowledge, get cheaper upgrades, and then go to the Imperial Age a bit quicker if he so wishes to do that. The game gets there. A long way between now and then, though, of course. Looking to get barracks back at home and start pumping out units, potentially. But, of course, the Chinese are going to be very far away from that castle age. It needs to pump a lot of food into these villages. Bear in mind, they have to pay full price for them. And it's not only two town centers, but it's two town centers that are working faster as well. But one good thing in this situation, he does have the Imperial official supervising the villages on deer. And it looks like he's going to be pushing in those deer camp as well. That's a bit of detail, keeping the army active, might as well. They're being paid. Might as well get them to do something. Now, Sassy will be fully aware of what's heading in his way, at least in terms of the castle age, because he's going to see all those villages, and there's only one reason you have that many villages and gold, and it is for a castle age. He's going to go for a stable opening, so that movement speed will be helpful. But bear in mind, though, go to the castle age with a stable here. It's something that the Chinese can still kind of counteract. If they've got spearmen in good spots, again, it could buy himself some time protecting against stable units. And uh, so there's often a reason why we do expect a lot of players to go for barracks units in terms of man at arms, or in this case, Gulam. It's a unit a lot harder to deal with necessarily, but it's going to opt for the mobility in the first instance, maybe to get some raiding damage in. And One thing that's concerning, though, is that the Chinese defensive units, or landmarks rather, do have uh, hand cannon slits, which are... A little bit more special, adept at dealing with the cavalry. And there's that third stable coming out. Plenty of food, plenty of gold, of course, for the Bastard Dynasty. Keeping up with the village account relatively well. Over time, though, we'll build up. And he's really starting to push those deer camp in. And getting all this food in such close proximity has really helped Sassy. He's going to be going to the castle age himself at a relatively decent time, i got to say, because bear in mind the Chinese villagers build fast. It's going to go up with the astronomical clock tower. No real surprises there. And this is where it's going to hurt the Abbasid dynasty. We talked about how it would be interesting to see what the timing is for Castle Age for the Chinese. And hey, it's just not that far behind. It's just not that far behind at all from the Abbasid dynasty. Bear in mind as well. The upgrades that the Chinese might look to get, he can supervise with the Imperial official. And so they come in in quick time. And this is why the matchup is just so challenging for the Abbasid dynasty. He's behind on economy. He's behind on military. And he's going to be level on the tech up of the castle age. Sassy in a really good spot. Walling up on the right side as well. Again, limiting the focus for attacks. Which is going to be important actually. Considering cavalry is the choice here for GOA. I like that walling up, i got to say. It's a bit of a different story if your enemy's going for Gulam. Because of course, the movement speed is just not on there. Comparatively... 
And so having the walls up like this limits the positions your enemy can attack and allows your spearmen to have to defend, uh, you know, much, much fewer areas. Limits the amount of damage that will come out from those cavalry. Picking off the two archers on the right side. And this is what we're talking about. Cavalry not getting too much value already because the spearmen are pushing back and veterancy just coming in for them now too. Now one thing to consider are the relics. Does have the mosque already up and running so could potentially get some of those quite quickly. So it has been walled out on the right side. Denies that relic being picked up. That's actually huge because that little uh, that, that imam I have to back away and take out this relic first. Try to sneak one in. And walling up and towards the Barbican villagers have to garrison inside. Should be a decent number of garrison on spots, but we'll lose a villager. Or maybe not, actually. I was curious to see why I didn't dive on that one. Backs away for now. Spim getting in position. And now Sassy. It's all about damage limitation. They can't afford to lose too many villagers. And it's the opposite for the Abbasid. They want to do as much damage as possible at this stage. They kind of need to, actually, at this point. Sassy looking to get the walls up on the west side. It looks like there is a red dot there. What is that? Two cavalry. Two lancers. We'll stop that eventually. When the villagers get there. But again, look at the walls. It offers so much protection. And I mean, sure, there isn't quite enough spearmen there yet. Well, there is now. They're heading. They're going to try and trap them in. And sure, the archers aren't getting too much value. But they are getting some value. Villagers, though, being poked and prodded. A couple of spearmen not in position just yet. Needs to get there quicker. Needs to keep at least a villager or two alive if he can. And push away the cavalry on the right side. And yeah, all this time that Sassy's buying is helping him significantly. Did take out the cavalry on the right side. The spearmen were able to gap close. Now he will eventually get the walls up, which is definitely going to help. Again, it really limits any sort of sort of angle of approach for GUA. But the army numbers starting to build up a little bit here for GUA. It looks like he's got so much food floating, and it's courtesy of the fresh food stuffs, right? He's just not having to spend as much on food for the villagers. That's a lot of food he's bringing in. 2,000. Might need to actually drop a market and rebalance that potentially. Putting in a couple of relics. Two coming in for Sassy. One already in play for GOA. Second one coming in. And the Chinese now taking the boar. Um, this is such a strong play, right? Not having to go for a farming transition for such a long time. He yeah, has killed three villagers so far. Now, the question is, is I'm surprised that actually Sassy is not a little bit further ahead on village account. I'm not entirely sure why. I mean, he's got two, only two uh, town centers. And it was a two town center Song Dynasty play. Maybe this, maybe Sassy was on purpose cutting, creating villages so he can pump out units. It's quite possible. Oh, villagers on the west side trying to get the deer camp, but again, Sassy keeping an eye on where a food resources could be coming in, and he will deny that. Army being sent, villagers being sent back out. But again, these little details, getting a villager kill here or two, or idling them out, is incredibly important. Going to go for another town centre on the west side, on that deer camp. Looking to catch up with the villager count. Sacred so, sites are being challenged. Now, overall, in terms of relic counts, GUA is getting a third. Sassy might just have to be content with the with two so far. They're going to get a keep on the west side. It, we kind of get to the stage of the game where gold is actually an issue. I love this keep. This is going to be a strong keep if it goes up because of the fact that, well, denying that gold, like, eventually the players are going to have to opt to get to these 8,000 gold vein tiles because they're going to run out of what they have at home. I mean, it's got a decent amount here still remaining, GUA, but eventually, for the longevity of the game, you know, Obviously, Sassy is thinking long term. 
The trouble is, there's a lot in his way. Oh, those villagers. Oh, he didn't attack me. If he just goes on past GOA. Oh, he, he just about. I mean, I don't know if he either spotted it or the rally point or the horse or the uh, the horsemen were clicked over there. And then they obviously aggroed. Wait, no, he's getting pulled back. No, why? Take out the villagers. He does head back, but I think the villagers might. I mean, I think most of them will go down, to be fair. It's unfortunate for Sassy. I don't think he's recognized that risky situation. Now, the Chinese villagers do build fast. I mean, I'm not sure they build that fast, do they? Wait, where are the horsemen? Oh, my God. They aggroed onto the outpost. That's a big problem. And this keep going up. Oh, this is just not meant to happen. It's not meant to happen, GOA. Unfortunately, his units weren't where they needed to be. And the horsemen, in many occasions, were trying to chase them down. But they just got aggroed onto something else. And they got distracted. And the keep's going to go up. Oh, God, that's terrible. And that's actually really significant. Keeps aren't easy to get rid of. And that's going to deny that gold vein very heavily. It might not matter in the next 5, 10 minutes, but give it 15, 20 minutes, it will certainly will matter. And that puts Sassy in a really strong position. Make no mistakes about it. It's one of those plays that is kind of very influential for the future of the game. In the next, yeah, 15, 20 minutes or so. Even allows him to get access to the boar. It's such a great keep and protects the sacred site. You can't ask for much more. And plenty of units in the middle of the map. He's got good map control, Sassy, with the walls. Bit of a raid with horsemen, though. This could be dangerous. There's not a lot at home here for Sassy. A lot of villagers will go down. They're going to garrison inside the village. A lot of them body blocks, though. You will get a good number of kills here. This is a good start for GOA to get himself back into the game. And the economy pretty much equalized with the Imperial officials. Do tip it a little bit in the way in the favor of the Chinese. Going against the Spearmen, though, does need to back away from that fight. Can't last there for too much longer, especially with their group of Spearmen heading there now. And he's got the farming transition with the granaries. There's not, I don't think there's too much the horsemen can get available now with the spearmen in, in position. Although, I take that back. There's plenty of village on that gold vein. Has to back away, but horsemen not diving on that just yet. A farming transition coming out for the Abbasid dynasty as well. A couple of horsemen sacrificed. Quick to try and deny that sacred site in the middle. A lot of units getting across. Does have an access point to the middle now that the Chinese army were pulled away a little bit. But an upgraded outpost. It's going to slow down the progress for the Abbasids. Onto the gold as well on the west side. Horsemen still cycling through. Just make sure the villagers having to pay attention. Going to take out those units in the middle. A decent number of siege. Mostly springles. So that will help against the nest of bees. He doesn't really have much in the way of damaging siege himself. He is moving further forward, though. The question is, he doesn't have much torch damage either. So the Barbican going to offer a lot of defense for the Chinese without the presence of siege. Bear in mind, though, he does get siege engineering for free, so he could potentially look to get a couple of rams. Feels like that could be a strong play. These horsemen, they've been dwindling in numbers for quite some time. They're going to try and torch things down. Springwell's backing off for now. I mean, he's just got enough here. It's just so much sassy in the right spots. He's got palace guards as well. Which will rip through a lot of the horsemen. I mean, I, he might win this fight, Jiwei, but it won't be a cost effective one, especially with the Nest of Bees now. And he's going to push this back heavily. Horseman numbers are down in the back of the base, and Jiwei has to back away. And Sassy, once again, funnels the attack in one particular spot, and he can focus there heavily. With that number of Nest of Bees, I mean, the Springles need to get on top of that if they can. Only three of them, though, remain. And the outpost survives. G8 slowly being pushed back, and the big concern for G8 is he's up against the Chinese economy, up against the Chinese army that's going to constantly pump out units with Nesta Bees behind them. And it's very, it's very difficult for G8 to deal with his number of Nesta Bees. He's got a Spring Ward as well, which really doesn't help. He's taking out a lot of the front line, G8 losing a massive army. And he just doesn't feel confident pushing out. Oh, if he's going to lose the Spring as well, that's going to be terrible. It'll allow the Spring Wards, allow the Nesta Bees rather, for the Chinese to do exactly what they want to do. And he's just going to fight Sassy. He doesn't mind fighting up against us. Decent number of crossbows, but there aren't that many heavily armored units for 
the Chinese pushing forward. Nesta Bees gets a couple of hits off on the Spring Old and he takes out the Spring Old. I mean, it's crazy to think about the Nesta Bees taking out Spring Olds when it's really meant to be the other way around. The outpost doesn't have much in the way of emplacements. And Nesta Bees themselves. Who needs Rams when you've got Nesta Bees? And bear in mind, he's going to get the second sex site in the middle, so gold income going to be escalating even further for Sassy. Slowly but surely, we've seen it once, we've seen it twice, we might be seeing it for a third time in this set. The GOA's army has to be pressurized back, and it's going to lose ground, it's going to lose production buildings, and that mosque is perilously, perilously close to that front line, and if that gets taken down, that's going to be three relics he's going to be out of. Bear in mind, he's got full control on this west side, this gold vein. Let's talk about gold veins for GOA. It's just this one here. And it's only 2,500 gold. I think if Sassy targets that, it could be an issue. I mean, GOA does have a decent bank of gold. But if he loses the relic, if he loses this gold income, and he might just with the battle scars running in, this could be game. Like, I love the strategic plays here. Both players have done it throughout this whole set. They've kept an eye on what resources are key at this stage of the game. Sassy recognizing that gold's an issue, and he goes straight for it. And he goes for the relics too. Sassy just pushing through and looking to snap as many of the Springles as he's got. And he's got four Springles here as well, Sassy, so he can just push on through. And their clock tower Springles as well might lose his army, but ultimately he's caused a lot of damage. He's killed 36 villagers in total. GOA struggling with that economy. Infantry coming on the back line does lose the Moscow, lose access to the, the relics. That's going to have to be picked up once again and could see a smash and grab. If there are any scholars, it doesn't seem like it for the Chinese at this point, but villagers being idled, so much of the economy idled, so much of the economy killed, and it's going to go for a farming transition on the back, but again, inventory, inventory going right through. It's not fully walled off, and this is looking precarious because, of course, once your economy is idled, it's hard to keep pumping out units, and the Chinese can keep pumping for days. It's got plenty of resources coming in, and farming transition continues for him, and Look at the production buildings, they're really starting to come down. He's massing up. He does have a good critical mass of crossbows, so heavily armoured units is not necessarily an option for Sassy, although he's going to try and go for a smash and grab with the relics. Going to go for a wallolo, doesn't quite manage it in the end, but nice idea. He's having to back away and just recover and recuperate. Palace guards, it's going to be tricky for him to really push with that, because the number of crossbows is looking good for the Abbasids. But mixture in a couple of spearmen. Make sure a couple of horsemen and he could be okay. Might lose the Nesta Bees for free. Relatively cheaply lost there, unfortunately, for Sassy, but it can happen. Oh, getting an outpost on the west side. I love this play, actually. Because a lot of the villagers here... This, I mean, this town centre is completely redundant at this point, with the outpost being there with emplacements. Villagers that pop out, trying to go to the, join the heart of the economy, won't be able to get past the outposts. He's starting to recover, but it feels like Sassy, he's happy with the damage he's done and he's going to go for a second wave soon. Give it time. He'll be cooking up a, a storm soon. Couple of horsemen just to find out what's happening. Tried to sneakily take that Nesta Bees doesn't quite manage it. Coming on the west side with a good number of crossbows. We're in a situation again where Nesta Bees could be really dangerous. Especially that mass ball of infantry. Will he spot this sassy? Will he engage? He's engaged with the palace guards for now. Back in the way though. Right move because there's too many crossbows. Now, I love the addition of the crossbows because, I mean, they do decent damage against, obviously, the, the palace guards. But they all do decent damage against the spearmen too as a ranged unit. Nesta Bees just to fire up, but a good number of Springles, or the Springles focus on the villagers at the worst possible time, and a lot of HP gets off of those crossbows. And he's going to start to focus on those Nesta Bees pretty well here for the Abbasids, does take out two. Should take out third position, no wait, the, the Springled focused on the infantry there at the worst possible time, it looks like he's going to lose the Springled. One Nesta Bee survives, and it's going to get maximum value out of that. Villagers walling up behind this. That's a good pushback for Sassy, I've got to say, Jiwe lost a lot. Bearing in mind one consideration, these crossbows cost food and gold. 
Whereas, of course, these spearmen just cost food and wood. So, whilst the... Actually, to be fair, the spearmen aren't really attacking, which is a bit of an issue. But if they were attacking, it would be a relatively okay trade if you're the Chinese. You don't necessarily mind losing what we call trash units, costing wood and gold. Uh, wood and food, rather, if you're getting units that cost food and gold. Because gold is going to become an issue. Especially when you're uh, having your main gold mined out. Try to get a keep on that gold. You can see the focus, the mindset of Sassy here. Really targeting the gold positions. Understandably so. Could be tricking, looking to try and burn through the Palisades on the west side too. Coming down through the middle. Military numbers looking relatively even and the third town center has helped him build up village accounts. Although this one not really getting too much value. I think this village just, just goes down. Does lose a lot of villages there on stone. That is not ideal for Sassy, but it will take out a couple of horsemen on the retreat. A couple of horsemen coming on the west side for Sassy. And it's going to Id idle a lot of a lot of villages on farms. GUA's economy is going to be attacked once again. Wallow comes off. Will he get it? No, he's going to get the. He's going to get it right now. He, he takes out the scholar eventually. And he's going to go around on the back. And he's going to mount a response in the middle too. It looks like a couple of horsemen being trickled in. But it does have a keep in that front position, which is going to definitely help him defend. Horsemen going to get as much value as they possibly can. They will go down eventually, but not without taking a couple of units out themselves. And I wonder whether a sacred type victory could be in the cards for Sassy. Could be a potential win condition because it does have a decent keep position on this west side. It does have the two sacred sites that remain other than that on the west side. And so it could be an option for him. Horsemen won't get too much value. These guys will go down pretty quickly. Here comes a ram on his own. Gonna need more than one. There's a second. Now, good numbers of military for GOA, but he's gonna run into that keep on the west side, and he can't deny it. And this is a really this keep has really changed this game. The eight thousand gold vein here, the four thousand gold vein, and it feels like GOA is gonna be struggling on gold himself. Like this is running out, he's really gonna struggle. He doesn't have that much in the bank, and at some point, he's going to have to pressurize. Behind all of this, by the way, the Chinese going up to the Imperial Age with the Spirit Way. The economy wing being chosen by Jiwe, which is an interesting one. Not opting for trade at all, understandably, but I mean, how else does he get gold? It's going to become a real problem for him. Oh, Horseman going to get a Spring Old for free, most likely. Has a trebuchet pressuring on the front lines, and with the Sacred Sight timer ticking. GOA is going to have to come up with something special. Bear in mind, this isn't actually match point, so if Sassy wins this game, he will win the best of five. He takes the engagement, but it's not really a fight that Sassy will win, but what he is doing is he's keeping GOA's army at home and buys himself more time to keep that ticking timer going down. Spearman being sacrificed on the front lines, getting villager kills on wood, and actually, considering... The wood situation is a bit of an issue for GOA. Struggling on gold, struggling on wood. That means no siege. And that keep's going to go down. The trebuchet's been working hard on it. He's going to lose that forward position. I think is really struggling. It's difficult to see a way back into the game. Now, he did relocate those three relics. But that's slowly being torched down as well. And without any access to gold, he's going to have to rely on spearmen, maybe archers. And if you're going up against Nesta Bees, that's always an issue. Imperial agent for Sassy as well, so it's not just the fact he's being outpositioned, he's being outtecked as well. Forward keep drop coming in. Sassy, let's see how many villages he rushes this up with. Not many, actually. Now, whilst they build faster, I don't think he has enough here. He needs to be careful. He might lose the villages. Uh, unfortunate for G Way, he didn't actually place the foundation, Sassy, because if he did, and if he took out the foundation, he would have lost the stone either way. Sassy will lose those villagers. The Imperial Age does come in for GUA, but he's going to need some time to get the tech up upgrades. But he's pushing this back nicely. 80 military to 36. Will Sassy be quick enough to mount another response? And the goodness to be shot off on the back line, or they will go down now. The Spearman poke and prod and should take it out. Does have a cannon in placement in that keep, so it's going to be hard for GUA to push this meaningfully. Two bombards working hard. 
A lack of nest bees, though. If you had a couple of nest bees still remaining, GOA wouldn't be able to mount this response. The trouble for GOA doesn't have much in the way of siege. So sure, he'll take out the army. Probably needs to take out the two bombards. He'll do good work to do so. But mostly ranged units will struggle, especially with boiling oil involved. And that keep... I mean, that keep's not going down. He's going to fight as best as he can to take out as many units at GOA. But he won't ever really overrun this position. Not without siege. And he's going to lose a lot of units for the boiling oil. It's still going to overrun quite significantly. Maybe look at to take out Trebuchet. Looks like he... Did he lose that keep? He did lose the keep at the back at home. Didn't quite repair it. Does have plenty of stone to maybe get a second keep of his own. But he needs to deal with this. He's going to need siege. And the biggest problem for GOA is he can't get siege. He doesn't have the wood. At least not a lot of it. In fact, where is he getting wood from? Is it this west side? It's hard to even tell. It's here. Of all places. Right in front of your enemy. But he has to do it somehow. Now, he won't quite be able to torch that down. And there was a keep coming on that wood line. This is a good spot. Sassy keeping an eye on things. His awareness of the map and where things are, it, it's really helping him out in this game. He focused on the gold when it mattered. He's focusing now on the wood when it matters. And he's building up an army once again. Bear in mind that, uh, you know, while Sassy has lost army quite badly at times, his economy is fueling it all and hasn't been idle for a long time so the con has been working overtime for the chinese working relatively efficiently and that keeping that position means that GOA will have absolutely no wood coming in going to try and secure this wood line on this side with a keep which will, will happen and he's got a stone wall on the right side as well yeah he needs this wood desperately this is going to become a focus point for the fight bear in mind GOA is kind of off of gold but if he's off of wood then there's no way back and Yep, certainly this is the focus at this point. Sassy needs to try and deny this area if he can. Sending his units there across now. Cavalry going to charge in. Take out a couple of Springles if they can. Allow the nest of bees to fire off. He takes out one Springle. It's absolutely huge. Massive nest of bees shots. Infantry dwindling in numbers now because of that. The Abbasid Dynasty really struggling. Despite having keep it. There it is then, gentlemen. The Abbasid Dynasty. G-Way taps out and it will be Sassy taking the set. Three to one, a great best of five. A really big thank you to both of these players battling it out. And what an epic, it was an epic. It was an absolutely epic best of five. And a big thank you to the sponsor, Andy. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure you drop a comment, a heart message to Andy who sponsored the tournament. Hope you guys enjoyed it and I'll uh, take care. Hope you guys take care and I'll see you guys on the next one.